love this church. I love this place. I love coming on Sunday mornings. Every every Sunday afternoon, I look at my Facebook feed, and Terry's posted something about how awesome church was or how excited he was to go. And I just love that. It makes it encourage me, me so much. It reminded me of a story. There was a, one Sunday morning, a mother went to wake up her son to tell him to get ready to go to church, which he replied, I'm not going. Why not, she asked. I'll give you two good reasons, he said. One, they don't like me, and two, I don't like them. The mother replied, well, I'll give you two good reasons to go. Number one, you're 54 years old. Number two, you're the pastor. I'm glad that's not, not the situation right now. I do love this church. There's another one. As, uh, an elderly woman walked into the local church, and a friendly greeter ushered her to the sanctuary, and he said, where would you like to sit? The woman replied, the front row, please. You really don't want to do that, the usher said. The pastor is really boring. Do you know who I am, the woman replied. No, he said. I'm the pastor's mother, she replied indignantly. Do you know who I am, the man said. No, she replied. Good. (laughs) So, Hopefully that's not the case, but uh, I think my mom pretty much knows everybody here, so I'll find out one way or the other. But I do love this church. I love the the idea of the church. Uh, our sermon series this September is called Why Church? You know, it's an interesting question to ask because sometimes it's one of those presupposed things that we know the answer to. Like, yeah, we go to church. We're Christians. We're supposed to do that on Sundays. And But why do we do that? Why do we come to church? What is a church? Is it a building? Is it people? Is it why there are different kinds of churches, different denominations, all this kind of stuff. But what is the church? And the reality is Jesus had the idea for the church. And there's there's two terms that we use for the church, kind of, uh, one of them is the universal church. And this is the global church. This is everybody that's a Christian, um, everyone that is a part of, of the body of Christ, every, you know, across the globe. So you can say, I'm a part of the church, and you can be, there can be somebody in Indonesia that says, I'm a part of the church, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we're a part of his global universal church, but there's also what we call the local church. So there's this idea of the universal church and the local church, and uh, Jesus talked about both of these, and Paul, the apostle, and the other apostles really kind of hammered out this purpose for the church, and so the local church is what we are right here. This is the our, our local body of Christ. And, you know, on Miyushki Road, there's like four or five other churches on our same street. And they're part of the, the universal church. So we're not divided just because we're in two different buildings. We have, two, we have a local church uh, that we are a part of as well. <clears throat> and um, there's a couple of verses. The universal church, Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 18. Now I say to you... Uh, I say to you that our, you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So he's talking about the global universal church in there. But then he also, in uh, Matthew 18, 17, he's talking about how to correct people, and he says, take your issues to, tell it to the church. Take it to the church. He's talking about the local church. He's not saying, post it on Facebook and let every Christian across the globe comment on your issue. So that's the the local church as well. And the uh, Apostle Paul, you know, he spent most of his ministry ministering to local churches. Matter of fact, when you read the New Testament, you see, okay, this book is called Ephesians. This book is called Galatians. This book is called Colossians and Corinthians. Like, why why are the named that way? It's because he was writing a letter to that church, the church that was in Ephesus, the church that was in Corinth. And so the... uh, the, he was he was ministering to local churches, and he would travel around and go to different places. And so uh, Paul had this to say in Romans. He says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. And so we, that is the, what we are in a local church. We all have different giftings, different uh, things that we're good at, things that we're not good at. And that's why we, we have hands and feet and different things. And I might be a liver and someone else might be, you know, something more glamorous than that. But we're all the body of Christ coming together. 
Bill Hybels, who's a, a, an amazing pastor in Chicago, he, he says that the local church is the hope of the world. And I really believe that. You know, it's not uh, because that's where we right now make take action. We right now reach our world. And that's really what we're called to do is, you know, a lot of times people say, I want to change the world. And I remember in high school one time thinking, I can't really change the world, but I can change my world. I can impact my world. And so that's really what we're called to do is the world that we're in, whatever world that looks like. If you're in finance, that's the finance world. That's the people you're encountering. That's the, you're, you're, uh, if you're a teacher, then you're impacting that world. If you are a stay-at-home mom, you're impacting the mom's club and stuff like that. And, the, and all of that, you're impacting our, your world specifically. And that's what's so awesome. That's why the local church is the hope of the world. So the question is, why church at Christ Family Church? Why church at CFC? And in the past, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've used four words to define our purpose, what we do, why we do church here at Christ Family Church. And those words, you've, you've probably heard them before if you've been here for any length of time, is worship, connect, grow, and serve. We've said that these four things are, 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 are what we do. So basically, every, everything we do focuses on these these four things. This summer, when we were we were thinking about these words, and just asking ourselves the question: Does this really define what we're wanting to do? Does this define our purpose and our calling at Christ Family Church? And these are great words, but they're a little bit um, somewhat abstract. You know, what does worship mean? What does connect mean? What does grow mean? What does serve mean? And so we've we thought. You know, we're going to change these four. The purpose behind them doesn't change, but we're going to present them as action words because action words are a lot easier for us to grab a hold of. It's a lot easier for us to, pl- to, to apply to our lives. So in this series, Why Church, we're doing four weeks where we're talking about our four action words, our action purposes, and they are, they are this. Um, the first is meet God. The second is find freedom. The third is discover purpose. And finally, the fourth one is impact your world. Everything we do at Christ Family Church is focuses on those things. Matter of fact, you could, you could simply say the purpose of Christ Family Church is to meet God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and impact your world. There you go. That's, that's the purpose of what we do. And we've, we've more or less um, created some programs and some, some things that, that function to help serve these purposes, but they're not necessarily... Uh, you know, lockstep. And so, for instance, meet God. Sunday mornings is really where we like to, to focus on that meeting God. That's the purpose of Sunday morning worship, weekend services. However, we meet God everywhere. You know, so we meet God in life groups and we meet God in different places. And so today we are going to talk about meeting God, that first purpose of, of our four purposes here at Christ Family Church. And there is a, a young woman in our congregation that this last year has come to know Christ and she's met God and she wanted to share her testimony. So let's watch Melissa's testimony of, of, of this last year. Before my relationship with Christ, my life was very different. I thought that all religions worship the same God, but different ways of expressing their faith stem from their cultural differences. To say the least, I was easily swayed and pretty lost. I had no foundation for that way of thinking. I hadn't felt complete at all in my life and wasn't even sure of who I was or wanted to become. I knew something needed to change. I decided that I needed to find something to believe in that is permanent and constant. I chose to go into church with my mind wide open, ready to see Christianity in a new light, a better light than my preconceived ideas. And I haven't looked back. I have had the greatest time in the last 10 months. I've grown so much spiritually, emotionally, and intellectually, met wonderful people, and have had awesome opportunities, all of which happened because of my relationship with Christ and the deepening of that relationship through fellowship. I feel like I'm whole and can actually live the life I want. In fact, I'm not fearful anymore of what comes my way. I welcome it all as each and everything that comes into my life is crafted by Christ. All right, amen, amen. I love I love hearing testimonies of people coming to God. It's the, it really is kind of is the, uh, the fuel to the fire for me. So that's an awesome story. So if you see Melissa, be like, hey, it was awesome, you did great. 
So meeting God is what we're talking about today. And, you know, that's kind of an interesting concept to, to meet God. And, you know, we've used that term, but encounter God, have an experience with God, all of those, those flow into that. And so today we're going to talk about where and how we meet God. So, like I said before, where, where do we meet God? That's the question. We meet God at Christ Family Church. We focus on weekend services. So that's, that's, that's our, our main thing. So everything that happens on Sunday morning, we've really thought through, and not just me or one, two, it's a corporate thing. We've thought through how does this really apply to meeting, how, creating an environment where people meet God. And that's really my goal is I want somebody that, that comes off the street, that's invited a neighbor, that can come into this place and have an encounter with God. That's why we structure the service the way we do. And that's really our purpose and our goal. But that really, the meeting God transcends far beyond that. And in fact, we have our four purposes. This one really should be in bold, meet God. Because without meeting God, everything else is, is pointless. There's, if we don't have an encounter with God, being a part of a church is pointless. It's all about meeting God and having an encounter with him. So there's other ways that we, we do that. We do that in our life groups, uh, growth track, dream team. We are meeting those, but then there's, there's more, um, you know, those are kind of programs, but there's more other ways we meet God through personal prayer. We meet God through corporate prayer, fasting, praise and worship, not just on Sunday mornings, but even just putting on music and, and praising God and worshiping God, uh, fellowship of other believers, as we sharpen each other, we can meet God. And so that's kind of where we might meet God. But today, I want to hammer down three things, three ways that we meet God. And there's, there's three important ways that, you know, God thought through a lot of stuff before he made us. And so we all interact with God differently. And we interact with each other differently. And we have a mind, we have a body, we have a spirit, we have emotions, we have all of this that comes together. And God meets us where we're at in all of those things. So there's a verse in the Bible that talks about, this is uh, the road to Emmaus. And that's going to be our main verse today. We have, Jesus does this, the, after he's died, he's risen from the dead. The disciples don't really know what's going on. There's been word that he's risen, but some of them haven't seen it. And Jesus meets two followers going on a seven-mile trip to a town called Emmaus. So he just kind of, they're walking and they're talking about all this that's happened. They're talking about Jesus, how he died, and people saying he's risen from the dead. I'm not sure what's going on. And, you know, they're confused. And so Jesus hides himself. I don't exactly know how he did that, but he hides himself from them so they don't recognize him. But he starts talking with them. He's walking with them on the road to Emmaus, which is what God does with us as he walks with us. And he says, uh, so he's, he, they're, they're talking about all these things, and Jesus says, well, what's, what's going on? What's happening? And he says, you must, they say, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on. And they tell him all about Jesus, about himself, even though they don't know it. And so then he has this to say. So they're, they're trying to talk to him about it. And then he, he educates their mind here. So the first way that we meet God is through the mind. In Luke, this is where this, uh, this story is told, Luke 24. And I'm going to start up about verse 28. It says, but this time, I'm sorry, um, that is incorrect. We're going to Luke 24, verse 25. And it says, Jesus is having this conversation. He says, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he, he doesn't appeal to their emotions. He doesn't appeal to anything. He doesn't go, voila, it's me. And like, you know, he, he, he just says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through the intellectual process of this. Goes to the Old Testament goes through all the verses in the Old Testament, all the scripture saying, look, this is what's pointed to the Messiah. So God meets us in our intellect. God meets us with our mind. That is one of the ways that, that he encounters us. C.S. Lewis 
many of you may know who he is. He's an author and then the, uh, the mid 20th century, awesome author, Christian author, was not raised a Christian, was an atheist until the age of, of 31. And he had a few friends that were also authors. One of them was Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings. And he talked through a lot of what, what about Jesus? So C.S. Lewis would present all these questions to him. And he said, what about this? What about that? And they would, they would talk through and have an intellectual conversation about God. And C.S. Lewis has this at the end of his book, Surprised by Joy. He says this. He said, I came into Christianity kicking and screaming, <laughs> which I think is awesome. Uh, you must picture me alone in that room in Magdalene, his college in Oxford, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted for even a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him so I e whom I eagerly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. It came through his mind. Now, the thing is, we're not, we can't segment everything that we have. If we, we have an experience in our mind, it's also part of our emotions. It's also a physical thing as well. But primarily, C.S. Lewis came through the understanding of the mind. So when God touches your mind, when God reveals himself to your mind, when he meets you in your mind, you have an understanding of something you didn't have before. He's, he is showing himself in that way. Now the thing is, we don't all encounter God the same way. Some of us have a very intellectual process. Melissa, when she just gave her testimony, you know, she, she had a lot of questions too. You know, so she was coming to youth group and she said, I've got a bunch of questions. You know, what about all these other religions and all these different things? And, and I said, well, do you read? And she goes, yeah, I read all the time. And I said, well, let's read a book. We'll both read it and then we'll get together. You write down all the questions that you might have and we'll talk about it. And so we found a book by Ravi Zacharias, Jesus and Jesus amongst other gods, I think is what it's called. And we both independently read it. And man, she had like a, a couple pages of notes of questions to ask and had an intellectual approach. But also there was something more than that too. There's also God touching our hearts as well. But that's the first way that God touches us through the mind. That's how he touched those uh, followers on the road to Emmaus. But the second way that we meet God is through our body. These are through our, our senses. And some people may meet God through a healing. Um, but today I'm going to talk more about just meeting God just through our senses and just, just our, our seeing things. So he says this 